good morning friends uh, so today i want to show you an elbow deformity in a 7 year old child so 2 months back he had a history of fall he had some pain around the left elbow and he is a right dominant child he writes with his right hand and does ma major activities with the right hand on the left hand on the left side he has a deformity at the elbow after the fall so initially they had taken him to a local bone setter who had applied a plaster for almost 6 weeks following which they had removed the plaster and now after 3 months the child is brought to us with a deformity at the left elbow. So when you have an elbow case the first thing you have to do is do check the attitude of the upper limb. So any deformity at the shoulder or the elbow or the wrist can change the attitude of the upper limb. So what is the normal attitude of the upper limb? The shoulders are placed in some amount of external rotation. The elbows are kept straight in zero degree flexion with the palm facing forward. So the same thing I am trying to ask the child to do and let us see what happens to his elbow. While mentioning the attitude, never mention carrying angle. Carrying angle is an entirely different part which you have to test later on after assessing the deformity of the elbow. So in this child I ask him to place the normal side first in the straight position. So when you observe the normal angle at the elbow is in some amount of valgus. So you can see the normal valgus over here which is around 5 degree to 10 degree in males. And on the other side you can see that the hand is moving towards the midline. That means there is some amount of varus on your elbow in this child. Okay. So you can see that the alignment of the arm with the forearm is in valgus on the right side whereas it is in some amount of varus on the left side. That means the elbow is moving away from the midline and the hand is moving towards the body. So now when you see that there is a varus in the elbow you should remember what all are the possibilities. So if there is a supracondylar fracture, the child can have a gunstock deformity which is a varus deformity and some amount of internal rotation that happens in the distal fragment after the fracture. So when it malunites, the limb goes into internal rotation distal to the fracture and it goes into varus. The other possibility is that there is some injury to the medial side and only the lateral side is growing. So that also can take your hand into some amount of varus. Another issue is if there is a lateral condyle fracture, the most common deformity that occurs after a lateral condyle fracture is that the medial side keeps growing and a valgus deformity can occur. But in this case, you see varus deformity. So you should also keep the possibility of a lateral condyle fracture and as you continue in your examination, you can understand from which part is causing the deformity. So the attitude part is over. On the inspection side, I also want to see if any other local scars, any prominences. So when you look at the local site, you can see that lateral side there is some prominence. So you are just inspecting now. So don't comment on whether it is a bony or a soft tissue when you are doing an inspection. Just say that you can see a prominence on the lateral aspect. Look at the posterior aspect. If there are any particular prominences there. So in this case you don't have any prominence on the posterior aspect. Check it on the medial side as well if there is any particular prominence. So compare with the other side. So you can see some prominence on the medial side as well in this particular case. So your inspection. The next thing is you see if there is any obvious deformity. For that I ask the patient to just abduct his shoulders. So you compare on both the sides. You can see that this is straight in 0 degree flexion and extension. Whereas in this particular limb if you see there is some amount of flexion. So now again you don't comment whether is it is a fixed deformity or not. You just observe and tell that the terminal extension is still remaining or there is an extensor lag. 
you don't comment whether it is a fixed deformity or not. The next one is you come to your palpation. So, apart from your local uh, tenderness and uh, your local uh, rise of temperature, what you have to see initially. So, this it's better you place the patient and look from behind. Okay, so I want to turn the patient now. So, in palpation, after your local uh, temperature and local tenderness, the next most important thing is to see the bony landmarks and their relationship. So, it is known as a Hutter's triangle, which is formed by the lateral epicondyle, the medial epicondyle, and the tip of the olecranon. So, you check it in 90 degree of flexion. So, it is better to mark your landmarks on the 90 degree flexion. Later on, you extend the elbow and see if the three points come in the straight line or not. So, I am going to mark the prominences. So, for the lateral epicondyle, what do you do? You start from the mid shaft of the humerus, palpate it, go slowly. You will get the supracondylar flare and then go distally. And there is the most prominent point that you can feel, which is the lateral epicondyle. So, you mark that particular point. Okay. So, once you have marked the lateral epicondyle, you can also rotate your forearm and see if that particular point is moving or not. If it is moving, then you are at the wrong point. It is mostly the radial head which rotates. So, here the lateral epicondyle does not move. The lateral epicondyle is marked. Now, coming to the olecranon tip. For that, you start from the... Now, for the olecranon tip, Olecranon, you know, it is part of the ulna. So, you start palpating from the mid shaft of the ulna. Go proximally, slowly and at one particular point, you can find the tip. So, it is not the entire olecranon process that you palpate. It is the tip of the olecranon process that you palpate and mark. So, there is your tip of the olecranon. Now, coming to the medial epicondyle. Maintain the flexion, start palpating on the medial side, come distally and then mark the medial epicondyle. It is almost similar to that of the lateral epicondyle. So, in 90 degree flexion, you can see that there is a triangle that is formed. Okay. So, if you mark the triangle like this, you can see that a well formed triangle between the three bony relations. Now, when you extend the elbow and then you can see that these three points that is the lateral epicondyle, the medial epicondyle and the olecranon tip. All these three come to lie almost at the same line. So, the Hutter's triangle becomes a straight line. So, that is the difference. So, this is on a normal side you check. You need not comment whether the triangle is isosceles or equilateral. It is always better to say that this particular triangle is isosceles or equilateral as comparing to the opposite side. So, that is a better way of telling. So, in this case, let us see what has happened to this triangle on the affected side. So, again I come to the affected side. I place the elbow in the same degree of flexion that I marked on the other side. So, for the lateral condyle, as I said, again from the mid shaft you come, palpate for the supracondylar flare and the most prominent point I mark. So, this is the lateral condyle. Okay. For the olecranon, again I come from the ulna, feel for the tip. So, I feel that the tip is somewhere here. Now, on the medial side again, I palpate from the shaft of the humerus, come distally and this is the tip of the medial epicondyle. Now, let us see the relationship as compared to the opposite side. So, this is one particular arm of the triangle, this is another arm and this is the base of the triangle. So, let us compare this with the normal side. So, you can see that in this particular triangle, these two 
limbs are almost the same. Now let us see in this particular triangle. The medial side limb is much more shorter as compared to the lateral side limb. This suggests that the lateral condyle is or it can be fractured and it is moved away from the normal relationship of the elbow. So which are the conditions in which you can have a distorted triangle? Either there is some issue with the olecranon tip, some issue with the lateral epicondyle or some issue with the medial epicondyle. It can also happen in a case of a posterior dislocation of the elbow or any fractures of either of the condyle. So what if there is an intracondylar fracture? If there is an intracondylar fracture, both these lines, both these points are far apart and this particular base is increased as compared to the normal side. Now let us see what happens in a supracondylar fracture. So the supracondylar fracture happens at somewhere this level. So when that happens, there is a tendency of the distal fragment to rotate or go into varus, but however, these three points are in the same relationship. That means in a supracondylar fracture of the humerus, usually these three points are not <coughs> affected. Or if there is a radial head fracture also, as it does not make any part of the particular three points, it does not get distorted. So the two conditions in which the bony, three point bony uh, landmarks or the Hutter's triangle is maintained is one is a supracondylar fracture of the humerus and the other is a radial head fracture. So the palpation part is over. So one important point what I got from the palpation is there is something wrong with the lateral condyle and the supracondylar uh, area was kind of okay because the triangle was distorted. So now after measuring you do the measurements and then next comes assessment of movements. So now we come to the movements of the elbow. So in the attitude we had already seen that there was some amount of flexion deformity at the elbow. So we do not know whether it is a fixed deformity or not. So if there is no more passive extension at the elbow that means it is a fixed flexion deformity. So we check that. So when you examine there is some amount of flexion deformity. I tried to extend it passively and see that still there is some deficit of extension. So on examination we can see around uh, 20 degree of extension is still limited. So your range of movement you can say that there is an FFD of around 20 degree and with further flexion up to around 130 or 140 degree. So this is how you comment. On the normal side when you see it is almost in zero degree flexion or full extension. So the range of movement you comment as zero to like whatever 135 or 40 degrees. So this is the range of movement on the normal side, on the affected side, some amount of uh, FFD and from that particular value you comment the further range of flexion. So whenever there is a supracondylar fracture what happens is that the distal fragment is internally rotated. So the child might have an internal rotation deformity as well at the elbow if it is a supracondylar fracture. So the internal rotation of the patient on the affected side will be increased in case of a supracondylar fracture. So in this case I want to see that also. So I ask the patient to actively as well as passively external rotate. So I see it is almost the same on both the sides that means there is no internal rotation deformity as such. Another way of uh, checking it is I make the patient stand. So you can see that on both the sides he is able to bring both the palms almost at the same level. It is almost the same on both the sides. That means there is no internal rotation deficit as such. It is almost the same on both the sides. So then again it comes to a more diagnosis of a lateral condyle fracture. So you do not comment whether it is a non-union or malunion in your uh, diagnosis. You say that you are suspecting either a non-union or a malunion and then I want to further confirm it with further x-rays. So this is how whenever an elbow case comes to you, you should start right from the attitude, go to the inspection, palpate the points, see whether the triangle is maintained or not, 
From that you will get an idea whether it is a supracondylar fracture or some fracture around the elbow itself and then you do your measurements. In the measurements also you can get a fair idea whether which part is uh, uh, fractured. If it is a lateral condyle fracture it can be displaced slightly laterally and the arm length can be little bit more as compared to the normal side. And the last part is you see the compensatory movements that happens at the shoulder. If there is a supracondylar fracture and there is an internal uh, rotation deformity that can be compensated at the shoulder demonstrating an increased internal rotation and less amount of external rotation. So now when there is a fixed flexion deformity, there is no complete extension at the elbow. So in that particular case, you won't be able to comment on the carrying angle or the varus or valgus angle. So if you want to comment on a carrying angle, it should always be in extension at the elbow. Only then you comment on the amount of deformity which you measure clinically. Otherwise, you need not mention the amount of coronal plane deformity.